Halo has changed genres from tongue-in-cheek power fantasy to epic space opera to Power Ranger soap opera. What the evolution of the series reveals has more to do with our own story than the lore and universe within Halo. As the IP has evolved and changed hands, its stories and characters have reflected the aging player base which, like Mr. Chef himself, might be questioning their place in the universe. Like so many video game protagonists, Master Chief was designed as a mostly silent, faceless killing machine that adolescent boys could project themselves onto as they experienced laying waste to legions of blue and orange blooded aliens. His counterpart and opposite in both gender and material composition, Cortana, was also likely created as a wise cracking piece of eye candy targeted at that same young male demographic. In universe, it is explained that Cortana chooses to remain naked as an intimidation technique. I always thought that a less than convincing explanation for having a naked woman in a game about space wars. I have another theory that fits better in universe and in theme for why Cortana likes it in her birthday suit. Cortana was made by copying Dr. Halsey's brain, the creator of the Super Soldier Spartan program. As an AI copied from a human, she's experienced angst or alienation of not having a proper body. Being naked and having people react to her body makes her feel more human. Fuck! I can feel! I have mass! I'm a fucking god now! You're fucked! What the fuck? I thought you were proud to be a hologram! So the series centers around a man that was conditioned and augmented into a machine and an AI that wants to be human. Their conflict against the Covenant canon has been read as a jingoistic celebration of a military mindset and even xenophobia. But if we consider the antagonist, there's a very straightforward theme of an enlightened secular technocracy trying to survive the onslaught of a theocratic death cult. Reason over blind faith and zeal. It only takes until the second installment for the player to ally with and play as one of the alien warriors. A clear message from the series that it isn't that the aliens are intrinsically evil, but only that they need to be enlightened to the folly of their faith. The tragedy that is the Covenant is a pretty big indictment of faith. We are witness to a cult so extreme that they nearly sterilize an entire galaxy. However, this condemnation of religion from the game's story becomes more complicated when we consider the double meaning of Master Chief's call sign. John 117 could refer to John chapter 1 verse 17. For law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The Spartans in universe were created to battle other humans, not aliens. The UNSC was in the process of quelling rebellions from those seeking independence. The Spartans were created to bring law and order, but Master Chief brings them grace by saving humanity from more than a few galaxy destroying events. This backstory reveals a nasty truth about the nature of the UNSC. They might be enlightened secular technocrats, but they are still totalitarian and autocratic. One could read a cynical ends justifies the means message here. But the UNSC and humanity are still challenged philosophically even after their victory over the Covenant. Halsey makes the point in Halo 4 that she did not intend for the Spartans to be mere weapons, but that their progression was the next evolutionary step for mankind. It's later revealed that Master Chief was actually the result of seeds that the Forerunner planted in humanity to aid us in taking up the mantle of responsibility. Or in plain English, Dominion of the Galaxy. The Forerunners at their peak were a Type 3 civilization, meaning they had virtually complete control over the Milky Way. With their unlimited resources, they took it upon themselves to construct the Halo Rings in order to wipe out the Flood, in doing so also work to preserve other sentient races, not just themselves. Beset with the ultimate trolley problem, blink the galaxy and save what you can or let the flood eat everything, the Forerunners did a horrifying thing by constructing the rings. But followed through with their sacrifice in order to protect complex intelligent and individualized life. Would our species as we are now be able to organize such an undertaking and make such a hard decision even if we had the technology to do so? We have no cosmic parents guiding our future in real life, at least none that I know about. If we survive the next few hundred years, I think it's a guarantee we'll start venturing out into the stars. As we go forth into the galaxy to plant our flag on strange and distant worlds, what kind of civilization will we be when we get there? Will we be beneficent caretakers and stewards of life? Not if our time on Earth is any indication. My hope is by the time we get to the point where we might ruin other worlds, we'll have learned our lesson with this one. I have to wonder if the Prophet secretly knew, maybe even just subconsciously, that igniting the rings would destroy everything. Maybe there's a kind of black-pilled nihilistic death drive behind the Covenant. 
Faced with the cosmic horror of a universe filled with ancient technology and immortal hive monsters, why not fucking end it all? Do not be afraid. I am peace. I am salvation. The Flood, in contrast, are a grotesque mockery of the eternal life promised in so many religions, both real world and the case of the Covenant. Both Grave Mind and the Prophets hold on real fart. There we go. Both Grave Mind and the Prophets speak of salvation for those willing to join their respective causes. In both cases, the end result is annihilation for the individual. Even with the Covenant failing to ignite the rings for their great journey, its members are reduced to cannon fodder as they fanatically throw their lives away for the sake of their religion. Even though the Covenant is not a hive mind, it still assimilates other races into the Alliance. The Covenant cannot exist in harmony with another civilization, you're either part of the great journey or you're a heretic. The Didac, a disgraced forerunner, awakens to set upon the galaxy just as the Flood and Covenant did. His ultimate weapon, the Composer, was originally meant to assimilate life into code. The Promethean Knights that serve his legions are revealed to be humans that were altered into serving the Didact through that assimilation. Though the humans are too outgunned to absorb or conquer any alien races, the UNSC holds a tight grip on its own colonies. If the humans had been the first to find the Forerunner tech had beat the Covenant to the arms race, what would their galactic conquest look like? Remember that the UNSC used experimental science on children in order to breed super soldiers so that they could keep systems from declaring independence. The galaxy in the Halo universe is stacked to the brim with civilizations attempting to assimilate and or otherwise control other populations. And while each civilization considers its success an imperative, each attempt at assimilation and control leads down a road that spells ruin. And at every turn these forces are thwarted by the Master Chief. If John 117 is meant in this universe to be a savior, then true salvation according to the series is freedom from assimilation. Master Chief and Power Armor in general is an expression of a wish to be godlike through the mastery of science and technology. As Halsey stated in The Forerunner Intended, the Spartan program gave humanity the ability to not only survive the many perils of space, but also the power of agency on a galactic scale. Spacefaring super soldiers are often framed in popular media as being divine. Master Chief himself can be seen as a fallen angel figure and is referred to by the Covenant as a demon. The biblical reference in his name and his exploits saving the galaxy give him a Christ-like stature, but his faceless appearance and cheeky one-liners almost contradict the reverence. I do know how to pick them. Lucky me. A great deal of emphasis is spent on the fact that John was chosen by Cortana, seemingly for no other reason than that he was lucky. The same emphasis of choice is also made when Cortana chooses Noble Six to carry her during the events of Halo Reach. There is no particular reason why Master Chief is elevated to the level of savior. There is no supernatural element to his power, nor is he at the end of some superior bloodline. He happened to inherit the mutations the Forerunner left in humanity and Fate did the rest. We have to remember that the Master Chief as a character was always meant to be a vessel or stand-in for the player. His triumph and mastery with the Noob 2 are power fantasies for the player to feel as though they are the ones shaping the galaxy through feats of extreme violence. Just as the Arbiter becomes who he is by assuming the armor of the Arbiter, we are all Master Chief when we pick up the controller. We all have the potential in us to be like Master Chief, to augment and train ourselves into powerful beings, but the series seems to suggest that we cannot do it alone. Master Chief and Cortana are free agents. Power in the galaxy is held by totalitarian civilizations possessed by groupthink, yet each of them falls to John and his AI as they strive against the most powerful forces in the galaxy, including at times the UNSC. While Master Chief and Cortana stand in contrast to the organizations surrounding them, the two of them don't seem well-adjusted individuals without the other. Cortana spends most of her time living in the back of Master Chief's head, almost to suggest that she represents Chief's anima, his inner feminine side. While John presents himself as an unstoppable suit of armor with pecs the size of couch cushions, he takes all of his orders from the lady voice in the back of his mind. The two are obviously distraught when separated. Chief almost blows the first halo without her guidance, and without Chief's protection, Cortana is imprisoned by Gravemind. Chief has trouble maintaining his ironic distance when Cortana is in danger. 
Mr. Chef can wade through scores of dead marines to deliver a deadpan one-liner while under siege from an advanced alien civilization, but he stopped cold when Cortana is revealed to be dying. Don't make a girl a promise you can't keep. It might be a complete accident that the series is about rings, items that symbolize weddings or the bonding of the feminine and masculine. Cortana and Chief remark to each other about keeping a promise, and you could read the destruction of the rings as the foreshadowing for the breaking of a promise. The didact and librarian are framed as another couple, one whose failure might be responsible for the downfall of their entire civilization. Their inability to reconcile causes internal conflict which renders the Forerunner unable to hold the mantle of responsibility. Chief and Cortana also split up eventually as Cortana takes the mantle for herself. After all of the conflict Cortana witnessed, it's easy to understand why she'd move to enforce peace in the galaxy. Yet John's dismay at being the test subject of the UNSC and his history fighting the Covenant lead him to distrust any overreaching authority. The two are no longer just separated, but like the didact and librarian are brought into direct opposition. Halo Infinite feels like it might be something of a soft reboot. Though 343 has said it will be a continuation of the Reclaimer saga, it's unclear what themes and story beats will survive into the next installment. If Cortana remains an antagonist for Jon into the next game, then we might see this dynamic play out or might be written out off screen. 343 altered the tone of Halo a lot with Halo 4, to where many of the series' most introspective moments happen. I could see 343 try to self-correct back to the feel of the original Halo games, but I think it'd be a shame if they don't resolve this conflict between the two main characters without due diligence. The original trilogy gives us a Master Chief that's nigh unstoppable, a godlike being that falls from the heavens to deliver salvation to the helpless. But the source of Master Chief's power isn't his augmented strength or energy shield. Master Chief is actually two beings, John and Cortana. They are the masculine and feminine operating in total unity, and through their combined talents are able to navigate a hostile universe. Like the Spartans, the institution of marriage has questionable beginnings. It's hard not to look at marriage from a modern perspective and not see it as an arrangement for the control of reproductive rights or for the affirmation of political allegiances. However, the contemporary idea of marriage has become one of ceremony. It's a symbolic bonding of two individuals witnessed by their friends and family with some legal perks sprinkled in to make it official. The Spartans grow from oppressors to liberators, just as marriage will have to evolve into a new social standard in order to survive. While its implementation through history might be one of patriarchy and oppression, its modern connotation has become more like the idealized conception of marriage from fiction and romance. Take for example the insistence by non-heterosexual people for the right to marry. In this context, there isn't any reproduction, so the utility of marriage as a way to regulate reproduction is eliminated and replaced with the symbolic conception of marriage as spiritual union. This is it, baby. Hold me. The future of paired bonding is just as unknown as the future of humanity. In many ways, the stagnation of the present moment feels like apprehension. We're going to keep evolving and changing, and it's not obvious who we'll become. I think it would be interesting if the Halo universe ended with a new covenant, with the UNSC and humans and the remnants of the Forerunners all bonding together and forming some kind of federation, some new unity, some new promise with each other to protect the galaxy and maybe not kill each other so much. But then where's the fun in that?